Er kontrollera att mobiltelefonen är avstängd. Tack för er uppmärksamhet.
<coughs> distinguished lecturer, excellencies, learned colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Uppsala University and the University Hall. Freedom from fear could be said to sum up the whole philosophy of human rights. This quote from Dog Hammerfell is spot on. Fear is what stands in the way. Today, refugees are coming to Europe in great numbers. We are looking at a situation we have not seen since the Second World War. Our own Uppsala conflict data program reported less than a month ago that the number of fatalities in armed conflicts has increased substantially and that 2014 was the most violent year since the end of the Cold War. This scares us. Even in a country like Sweden, with 200 years of peace, we feel the threat. Many react by shutting the door. They seem to think the world becomes less frightening if we keep our distance and look away. But even if fear is growing, hope prevails. A great many people are doing what they can to welcome those who flee for their lives. The results are heartening. Sometimes tragedy, tragedy brings the, out the best in people, causing us to reach deep within and find the strength to do good. In 1953, Dag Hammarfeld wrote, Our work for peace must begin with the, within the private world of each one of us. To build for man a world without fear, we must be without fear. To build a world of justice, we must be just. And how can we fight for liberty if we are not free in our minds? How can we ask others to sacrifice if we are not ready to do so? Dag Hammarskjöld began his studies at Uppsala University in 1923. He got his Bachelor of Arts degree in Romance Languages, Philosophy and Economics in 1925, did a further postgraduate degree in Economics in January 1928 after having spent a semester at Cambridge. He then turned his attention to the study of law and received a bachelor degree in that faculty, completing his studies at Uppsala. The university registers his graduation on the 15th of December, 1930. Uppsala was his hometown in many ways, and when he died, our city was the focus of the world's attention and even more so when he posthumously received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1961. Dag Hermafrod kept a diary. He started keeping it in the 20s when he was a student here in Uppsala. In the book, Vagmaken, Markings, some of his notes are collected. As I did last year, I would like to quote a few words from the diary. In an extraordinary way, it summarized Dag Hammarfeld's trajectory and it gives a perspective I believe we need when we are put to test. Hammarfeld wrote in the diary, never measure the height of a mountain until you have reached the top then you will see how low it was. For today's students, I do think Dag Hammarfeld sets an example. 
It is therefore appropriate that our university and the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation instituted these lectures in the memory of Dag Hammarskjöld. The first Dag Hammarskjöld lecture at Uppsala University was given in 1998. To date, 16 individuals have been invited to give the lectures on the ground that they in significant and innovative ways have contributed to a more just, peaceful, environmentally sustainable world for valuable achievements in politics or research. Professor Wallenstein will now introduce this year's lecture to the audience. His Excellency Dr. José Ramos Otta, Nobel Peace Prize laureate and former president of Timor Lest. I would also like to mention that Professor Wallenstein would moderate a brief question and answer session for the audience after the lecture. Please, Professor Wallenstein. Your Royal Highness, Mr. President, Rector Magnifica, Excellencies, students, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to introduce the speakers of this year's annual Dag Hammarskjöld Lecture, His Excellency José Ramos Horta. He was the president of the De Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste in 2007 to 2012, before that being Prime Minister, Minister of Defense and Minister of Foreign Affairs. Indeed, I take note of the fact that your CV actually also includes a master's degree in peace studies. Something for students here to note. Uh, from Antioch College in Ohio, the United States. Uh, Mr. Ramos Horta was the committed spokesperson for the independence of East Timor. The country being a Portuguese colony declared itself independent in 1975 but was invaded by its neighbor, Indonesia, in spite of a strong popular sentiment to the contrary. You, Mr. Ramos Horta, was instrumental in keeping the UN and the world focused on this situation. For long, it was an uphill battle. A turning point came in 1996, when the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to you and your compatriot, Bishop Belo. It raised awareness, and when the peaceful revolution came against the military regime in Indonesia, the prospects of freedom increased and was finally confirmed with the independence of East Timor as Timor-Leste in 2002. During your terms of ministers and president, you engaged in reconciliation with Indonesia, something which also has worked out uniquely well. In recent years, President Ramos Horta has been uh, of great service to the United Nations as a special representative of the UN Secretary General to Guinea-Bissau in 2013-14, and chairing the commission that today's speech deals with, the high-level independent panel on UN peace operations. It's part of a series of reports assessing UN activities with respect to peace operations peace building and gender equality. It is not the first time, Mr. President, we have the honor of your presence here in Uppsala. There was, in the late 1990s, a secret track of talks between you and representatives of the Indonesian government through the auspices of the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University. Many were involved, not least uh, Dr. Shell Oke Nordqvist, who is in the audience today. So, Mr. President, welcome back to address the audience today on the topic Building Peace, Strengthening the UN's Role in Sustaining Peace. The floor is yours. Your Royal Highness, 
Rector Magnifica, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be on this rostrum following on the footsteps of greater luminaries who preceded me. That we invited someone originating from a small village of uh, a remote little country situated on the edge of the wall to speak here in this August forum is an illustration of uh, your generous heart more than uh, it says about my possible worthiness. Doug Harmagzol, diplomat, economist, author, Secretary General of the United Nations, perished on 18 September 1961, just past midnight, as his DC-6 plane crashed shortly before landing in Endola, a dot on the map of northern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. The cause of Harmagjol's death remains shrouded in mystery, just as the murder of US President John Kennedy two years later. There were enough people and interests who would want Doug Harmagjol dead as he searched for peace in the newly independent Congo, a private possession of King Leopold of Belgium till 1908. It is fitting here that I also pay homage to another great Swedish nobleman who preceded Doug Harmagjol as a dedicated and courageous mediator, Falk Bernadotte, Count of Wiesborg, diplomat and nobleman who was the first UN envoy sent to the Middle East in 1948 to try to bring about an acceptable solution to all parties, Palestinians, Arabs, and Jews. As head of the Swedish Red Cross, Falk Bernadotte negotiated the release of 31,000 prisoners from German concentration camps, including 400 Danish Jews. Tragically, Falk Bernadotte, like many other great men of peace, was murdered by extremist elements as his search for a fair and just settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Jews' extremist elements assassinated Falk Bernadotte in 1948. And long after the ultimate sacrifice of the two great Swedish statesmen, Falk Bernadotte and Dag Harmagjol, peace in the Middle East remained elusive, and the UN is mired in Congo, one of the oldest and one of the most expensive United Nations peacekeeping missions in Africa. Your Royal, Royal Highness, Rector Magnifica, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Your generous people and wise leaders contributed much towards world peace, freedom and dignity of many millions. In the, 90s, in the 1960s and 70s, you protested the insane Vietnam War. In the 60s, you were the only Western European country advocating and actively supporting the struggles for emancipation and freedom of the enslaved millions on the African continent. You shelter countless political refugees and provide them with material support, a free public platform to publicize and advance their struggles. You were among the most generous of all in the provision of development assistance to the newly independent Asian and African nations, from Vietnam to Tanzania, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, to mention only a few. I haven't been in here in many years, but I recall that it was here in Uppsala that sometime in 1997, Swedish mediators from this university managed to bring I and some Timorese compatriots for discreet talks with senior Indonesian officials as we began to explore the path of dialogue towards a resolution of the Timor-Leste conflict. Today, my country is free, peaceful, and on a relatively strong economic and development growth. The latest UN Human Development Index for Timor-Leste illustrates the progress we have made in less than 15 years on several social and economic indicators, we are doing much better than Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Nepal. 
and all of Sub-Saharan Africa with only two exceptions, Cape Verde and South Africa. Australia, Brazil, China, Cuba, the European Union, Germany, Ireland, Japan, New Zealand, Portugal, Republic of Korea, Spain, UK, and USA are among our generous, steady partners. Beginning with small steps in 2003-2004, Timor-Leste and Cuba developed a successful partnership in the health sector with the deployment of more than 200 Cuban doctors to Timor-Leste and 700 Timorese medical students were sent to medical schools in Cuba. All have graduated and all have returned. At the same time, Cuba set up our first medical school ever in Dili, where 400 students are being trained. By 2017, Timor-Leste will have more doctors as percentage of population than any country in Asia. Our other friends and neighbors, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand have provided technical assistance, training, and scholarships assisting Timor-Leste in our critical area of state building. The United Nations system, agencies, funds, and programs, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank have been in Timor-Leste from day one and continue to assist in our peace consolidation and development efforts. After 24 years of an often brutal conflict, Timor-Leste and Indonesia enjoy an exemplary relationship at all levels. From day one of our independence, our leaders of our two nations wisely and pragmatically made a conscious decision, determined decision, and opted to look forward and show the path of dialogue, reconciliation, and friendship. Our people, though still bearing in their bodies and soul fresh wounds of the conflict, endorsed the leader's wise decision to pursue a process of healing and reconciliation rather than allowing ourselves to be hostage of the past. We resisted the temptation of revenge. Indonesian people and leaders deeply absorb in their own complex democratic transition following the dramatic events of 98-99, responded positively to our approach. They met us halfway, accepted our hand of friendship, and together we have built an exemplary relationship. Your Royal Highness Rector Magnifica, I express my sincere admiration to those of you in Europe, particularly the average individuals and families and leaders who, in spite of difficulties, nevertheless have shown heartwarming compassion and welcome hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing the wars in the Middle East and extreme poverty in Africa. Doug Harmagjol was a, an aristocrat. I'm not. I come from a very different background. I grew up in places like Lakluber, Bariki, Atsabe, Laga. You couldn't even find in a map. If you look on the Timor map, you couldn't find these places where I grew up. As poor, as remote, forgotten as any village anywhere in the world can be. As a child, I was mostly barefoot. I got my first pair of shoes for Christmas of 1957. And as I didn't want it to be worn out too soon, I wore it only once for the midnight Christmas mass. After the mass, I carefully put it away, saving it for next Christmas. Only once in a while, I would pull out my cherished shoes, look at it lovingly, and daydream about the next Christmas when I could proudly wear them again. And when the next Christmas did arrive, to my utter shock, my feet no longer fit in those shoes. I was puzzled how those shoes could have just shrunk. Had I known, I would have worn them every day. So I wore, I wore those shoes only once. Fast forward 20 years, and I found myself in New York between 1975 and the late 1980s. I lived in New York, and to survive, I did occasional work, including as a helper in a Chinese takeaway food business. 
My first engagement with the UN began in December 1975, when at age 26, on the eve of the feared invasion of the country, I was sent to New York to advocate and plead with the Secretary General, General Assembly, and Security Council to prevent the much anticipated and feared invasion. On 7 December 1975, following a state visit to Indonesia by President Gerald Ford and Secretary of State Kissinger, Indonesian forces began what was to become a 24-year occupation. This was 1975, the height of the Cold War, the immediate post-Vietnam, a senseless war that ended with the mighty U.S. being ignominiously defeated by an Asian peasant army. Timor-Leste was a footnote of the Cold War. Our people expendable and sacrificed in the name of God and anti-communism. So I have had about 30 years of engagement with the UN, primarily as an outsider, a victim looking for help. I observe up close the para paralysis and dysfunctionality in the Secretariat, caused by poor leadership in the Executive Office of the Secretary General, and key departments where personal ambitions and agendas, provincial mindedness and turf rivalries, exacerbated by almost daily interference by member states, hamper the entire system. But I was also fortunate to have met exceptional UN staff who, in spite of relentless pressure by member states and a senior management lacking in integrity and courage, truly embrace the ideals and principles embodied in the Charter. While I, was, I witnessed and learned sad lessons of blatant double standards and hypocrisy on the part of many member states, large and small, rich and poor, I was also fortunate in meeting diplomats who had a deep conscience. I was privileged to have served with 15 outstanding colleagues with very rich, diverse background, and supported by a team of the best people drawn from the United Nations Secretary General, when in October 2014, we were asked to review the whole architecture of the UN peace operations. We were tasked by the Secretary General to review peace and security architecture, its strengths and weakness, building on the Brahimi report and then to advise the Secretary General and Member States on how to transform our organization to better address the new security challenges facing us all. The challenges of the 21st century, as we know, are enormously complex and overwhelming in its intensity and spread. The UN peace and security architecture is under severe stress with more than 100,000 armed personnel deployed in 16 peacekeeping missions and with more than 30 non-armed special politi political missions across the globe. The overall UN core budget is modest by any standards of measurement. However, while there have been significant improvement in efficiency management in the last 10 years, there is urgent need and room for improvement to end duplication, waste, and inefficiency. And I'm often surprised, baffled, at how some Western leaders protest over the core cost of the UN and its peace operations as excessive. But they easily find hundreds of billions of dollars to rescue mismanaged banks, insurance and housing companies, failed auto industry companies. The Secretary General and his senior management team expect the Security Council to give the financial means and tools commensurate with the mandates, but for the organization to meet the expectations of its members and deliver peace and security, it must also change the way it is managed and how it operates. On 16 June, after months of intense listening to all stakeholders, member states, UN departments and agencies, special representatives and envoys, force commanders serving in the field, regional organizations, academics, civil society advocates, community leaders, 
And after reading through more than 80 written submissions our panel received, my esteemed colleagues and I delivered to the Secretary General our report entitled, Uniting Our Strength for Peace, Politics, Partnership and the People. Now allow me to share with you the key thoughts and recommendations contained in our 100, our 100 page report. We recommended four essential shift transformations. Four essential shifts must be embraced in the future design and delivery of UN peace operations. If real progress is to be made and if UN peace operations are to realize their potential for better results in the field. First, politics must drive the design and implementation of peace operations. Lasting peace is achieved not through military and technical engagements, but through political solutions. Political solutions should always guide the design and deployment of UN peace operations. When the momentum behind peace falters, the United Nations and particularly member states must help to mobilize renew political efforts to keep peace process on track. Second, the full spectrum of UN peace operations must be used more flexibly to respond to changing needs on the ground. The United Nations has a unique broad spectrum of peace operations that, that it can draw upon to deliver situation-specific responses. And yet, it often struggles to generate and rapidly deploy missions that are well tailored to the context. The sharp distinctions between peacekeeping operations and the special political missions should give way to a continuum response and smoother transition between different phases of missions. The United Nations should embrace the term peace operations there cannot be continuing artificial boundary distinction between peace uh, peacekeeping and the special political missions. Peacekeeping and special political missions are artificially separated, managed by two departments, leading to bu bureaucratic rivalry and infighting. Hence, the panel proposed the fusion of the two core UN peace and security functions into a single peace operations concept under a new Deputy Secretary General charged with the Department of Peace Operations. We also recommend sequenced and prioritized mandates will allow missions to develop over time rather than trying to do everything at once and failing. Third, a stronger, more inclusive peace and security partnership is needed for the future. A stronger global regional peace and security partnership is needed to respond to the more challenging crisis of tomorrow. Fourth, the UN Secretariat must become more field focused and the UN peace operation must be more, be more people centered. There must be an awakening of UN headquarters to the distinct and important needs of field missions and a renewed resolve on the part of UN peace operations personnel to engage with, serve and protect the people they have been mandated to assist. Conflict prevention and mediation must be, back, be brought back to the fore. The prevention of armed conflict is perhaps the greatest responsibility of the international community, and yet it has not been significantly invested in. A decade ago, the World Summit held from 14 to 16 September at the United Nations headquarters in New York brought together more than 170 heads of state and government. It was supposedly a once in a generation opportunity to take bold decisions in the areas of development, security, human rights, and reform of the United Nations. 
The agenda was based on a, an achievable set of proposals outlined in March 2005 by Secretary General Kofi Annan in his report, In Larger Freedom. It called for collective Security Council actions when national authorities are incapable or are unwilling to protect their own people from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. It then went on to set up two new bodies, a peace-building commission to help countries in transition from war to peace, and a strengthened human rights council. Whether these two institutions have delivered on their promise is a whole different question. Member states have not sufficiently invested in addressing root causes of conflict, nor has the United Nations General been able to engage early enough in emerging crises. The UN must invest in its own capacities to undertake prevention and mediation, and in its capacity to assist others, particularly at the national and regional level. This Security Council, supported by the Secretariat, should seek to play an earlier role in addressing emerging conflicts, and must do so with impartiality. At the global level, the United Nations must mobilize a new international commitment to preventing conflict and mobilizing partnerships to support political solutions. It must find ways to draw on the knowledge and resources of others beyond the UN system through civil society, community, religious, youth and women's groups, and the global business community. The panel stress that protection of civilians is a core obligation of the United Nations, but expectations and the capability must converge. Significant progress has been made in promoting norms and frameworks for the protection of civilians, and yet, on the ground, the results are mixed, and the gap between what is asked and what peace operations can deliver has widened in more difficult environments. The protection of civilians is a national responsibility, and UN peace operations can play an important role in supporting government to execute that responsibility. The United Nations must rise to the challenge of protecting civilians in the face of imminent threat, and must do so proactively and effectively but also with recognition of its limits. Protection mandates must be realistic and linked to a wider political approach. The Secretariat must be frank in its assessment to the Security Council about what is required to respond to threats to civilians. In turn, member states should provide the necessary resources and lend their influence and leverage to respond to threats against civilians. When a potential crisis occurs, UN personnel cannot stand by as civilians are threatened or killed. They must use every tool available to them to protect civilians under imminent threat. But at the same time, clarity is needed on the use of force and in the role of UN peace operations and others in managing armed conflict. While some missions are working to implement ceasefires or implement peace agreements, others are operating in environments with no peace to keep. They are struggling to contain or manage a conflict and to keep alive the prospect of a resumption of peace process. The panel believes that the United Nations may see more, not less, of these situations in the future. Where armed conflict is ongoing, missions will struggle to establish themselves, particularly if they are not perceived to be impartial. Although efforts are underway to strengthen capabilities, UN peacekeeping operations are often poorly suited to these operating environments, and others must come forward to respond. The panel believes that the UN troops should not undertake military counter-terrorism operations. Extreme caution should guide the mandating of enforcement tasks to degrade, neutralize, or defeat a designated enemy. 
Such operations should be exceptional, time limited, and undertaken with full awareness of the risk and responsibilities for the UN mission as a whole. The panel heard many views on the core principles of UN peacekeeping. The panel is convinced of their importance in guiding successful UN peacekeeping operations. Yet, these principles must be interpreted progressively and with flexibility in the face of new challenges, and they should never be an excuse for failure to protect civilians or to defend the mission proactively. Peace processes do not end when a peace agreement has been signed or an election held. We are so familiar with it almost every day in South Sudan. Peace agreements as often are signed as they are broken. The international community must sustain high-level political engagement in support of national efforts to deepen and broaden peace process of inclusion and reconciliation, as well as address the underlying causes of conflict. Peace operations, like other actors, must work to overcome deficits in supporting conflict-affected countries in sustaining peace, including supply-driven templates and an overly technocratic focus on capitals and elites and the risk of unintentionally exacerbating divisions. Missions must focus first and foremost on creating political commitment and the space for others to address important elements in sustaining peace. The security sector must be a particular focus owing to its potential to disrupt peace in many countries, with the UN in a convening and coordinated role if requested. In sustaining peace, the UN system must overcome structural and other impediments to working together, including through more innovative resource options. Missions must work closely with their national counterparts and the UN and regional partners to ensure the, the, that the least the disruption is caused when they transition and depart. I also want to mention that in carrying out our work, the panel was mindful that the review of the UN peace operations was taking place in parallel to two other important reviews to the peace and security pillar of the UN's work the review of UN peace building architecture, peace building commission, peace building support office, and the peace building fund. And the very important global study on the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. In this regard, we consulted with the panels working on the other reviews and have advocated the changes and reforms that result from these processes must be coherent and not further contribute to fragmentation in the system. In particular, I want to mention a common finding in all three reviews, that the UN is not doing enough to implement what has been known as the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Gender equality, and women's empowerment on issues of peace and security must be made central to the UN's work in promoting peace as women's participation is key to sustainable peace. Your Royal Highness, Rector Magnifica, Excellencies, we are pleased that our report has received widespread support from all our partners. We are nevertheless concerned that the Secretary General, in his own report to the GA on 12 October, failed to strongly advocate for the full implementation of our core recommendations. One seasoned UN diplomat eloquently described the Secretary General's report to the GA as a decaffeinated version of our report. The systemic weaknesses in the UN Secretariat, characterized by turf tensions and rivalries, are already emerging and threaten to undermine some of our key recommendations, namely in regards mindset changing in the Secretariat, entrenched headquarters ossified bureaucracy, 
to be respectful and supportive of those operating in the field. The panel called for several foundational changes in how the UN work in countries shattered by conflicts. One important set of recommendations is that I fear has not received the attention from member states that it deserves is related to bureaucratic reform. We call for decisive move away from the mindset of headquarter bureaucracy not attuned to the needs of field operations. Can we prevent social and political tensions from escalating into violent conflicts? Can we do better in bringing parties in a conflict to the table and restore peace? And how can we build durable peace? In some cases, neutral and credible national and or external actors may be able to discreetly or openly influence behaviors and policies among competing actors when those involved are committed to prevent escalation of the political conflicts and welcome advice. But too often, individual pride and egos block neutral help, domestic or external. Too often, those in power do not have the wisdom and humility of the truly great in embracing the other half who disagree with them. And the opposition itself commits its own mistakes when it overestimates its own power. So it means it underestimates the adversary. And when this happens, everybody miscalcul miscalculates. My humble advice, when we are at the top of the mountain, embrace those on the fringes of power and privileges. In victory, be magnanimous. Embrace the vanquished adversaries. If they are on their knees, help them to their feet. Invite them to join in the new enterprise of peace. This has been my message in my own country. Every time I address our people in di different circumstances, when I hand over the presidents to my successor, in my very short three minute departing speech, I repeat this message. There are many simple ways to prevent conflicts and some old tested methods are genuine patient dialogue, consultation and empowerment of all, making all feel part of the nation. All it actually requires is serious investment in mechanism of dialogue. And dialogue means listening attentively and respectively to the other side, accommodating their views as much as you can. Leaders supported by the international development partners must carefully study and address the many obvious causes of tensions, namely abject poverty of the majority in contrast with the opulence and ostentation of few, real or perceived discrimination and exclusion. They must engage community and religious leaders in developing strategies and inclusive policies that leave no one behind. Corruption and ostentation are causes of inequality and tension. The more a country is free from corruption, the more leaders show humility and integrity, the more they are respected and are followed, the better the chance for peace to gain roots. In too many countries, rather than embracing ethnic, cultural and religious diversity as a blessing, leaders try to suppress particular ethnic groups their language and religion in the name of an artificial national unity, unity of the majority ethnic group. When a particular ethnic religious minority manages to achieve power, the case of the Alawites in Syria, it builds a powerful minority army, intelligence apparatus to protect its community from the majority. There are no shortcuts to peace, sustainable and equitable development. Peace has to be built block by block. Extreme poverty eradication is a moral imperative for all and is a sine qua non condition for the attain attainment of durable peace. 
ODA has been for decades the prime tool employed to assist poorer countries in freeing themselves from chronic poverty and instability. Tragically and unwisely, in a simplistic and knee-jerk reaction to the economic financial downturn that began in 2008, almost all OECD countries, exception being the UK and Nordic countries, opted to impose draconian cuts on ODA budgets. The UK and the Prime Minister David Cameron made the courageous and wise decision in increasing UK ODA budget to 0.7% of its GDP, thus becoming the only G7 country to have met this target of 0.7% of national GDP. And Prime Minister Cameron's decision is even more commendable as this was done in the midst of the ongoing financial crisis. So UK is the only permanent member, Security Council, the only G7, the only G20 that has increased its ODA to 07, as has been recommended by the UN for the past 30 years. To prevent conflicts and wars, heal wounds, reconcile communities and nations, build durable peace, we require leaders with vision, courage, determination, humility, and compassion. Our collectivity called the United Nations is made up of its many parts, and the parts are the peoples of the world. The UN of Dag Harmagzol, a UN fit for purpose to serve the cause of peace, a UN of the people is under severe stress and is challenged in many fronts. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, <clears throat> as we were working on our report, I read a heartbreaking story of a girl from South Sudan. I read it in Huffington Post. Her name is Nyakahat Pal, three years old. Her father blind. In the midst of the war, from her village somewhere in South Sudan, she guided her blind father through dangerous tracks, walking for four hours. Can you imagine a three-year-old girl guiding an adult, walking for four hours, looking for a UN center? She found UNICEF. And there she was spotted, she was registered, interviewed, she told the story. So I decided to dedicate the, our report to Nyakahat Pal. Her story, a story of resilience and survival, is also an indictment of the collective failure of the UN, failure of its regional partners and neighbors of South Sudan for their inability, our inability to prevent the implosion of the country and the ensuing war. However, Nyakahat Pal's story also underlines the indispensability of the UN. For all its weakness and limitations, the UN is there in South Sudan, in these conflict regions, its dedicated personnel facing extreme hardship and risk to their own well-being and life, and working long hours, they feed, shelter, and save lives. We can do more, we can do better, we can prevail over hatred and extremism. Peace will prevail. Your Royal Highness, I pray to God, the Almighty and the Merciful, to continue to bestow on the Majesty the King and Queen of Sweden and their esteemed royal family and the people of Sweden bountiful health and endless happiness. I thank you.
thank you very much, Mr. President. I think uh, you have touched us very much with this story from the little girl in South Sudan, but you also have touched us by telling about your own shoes. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure your report will give a lot of footprints. Uh, whether they are with shoes or not, I don't know. Um, we have uh, some time for questions, and uh, there are microphones. There are people up there, okay, with microphones. So indicate uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, and while you think about your question, uh, I'll ask one to you, uh, because you have emphasized very strongly here that the Secretariat is an important actor, the UN Secretariat, and, and that, of course, is led by the UN Secretary General. And with your experience, you have seen a number of Secretary Generals to operate, and as we all know, there will be a new Secretary General elected next year. What would you say are the most important qualities that is needed for, for a Secretary General? Who, who would be willing to carry out your report? <laughs> well, uh, should I answer? Yeah, yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, well, that's a very difficult uh, question to answer. Well, this is a university, uh, you know. We, we <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I would say I make no comment, and what I say is not uh, an opinion or evaluation of past secretary generals. I would only say that uh, the perception or the common uh, uh, say that the Security Council, uh, since Armagjol, Armagjol, after or after Armagjol, because apparently he was uh, too smart, too independent-minded, that's what the common uh, popular saying, wouldn't want another Secretary General who is like Doug Harmagzol, too smart, too independent-minded. Whether that's correct or not, that's popular saying I heard in the UN. Uh, but if that is the case, nevertheless, in the last few years, I believe in my uh, exchange with uh, all the P5 and others and uh, grow, uh, emerging uh, powers, uh, they want a Secretary General precisely of the mold of uh, Doug Harmagjol. A Secretary General that uh, is, uh, has vision, strong personality, at the same time, obviously, ability to negotiate, to bring all parties uh, to the table and uh, forge consensus when there are, where there are profound uh, differences. So it's uh, what might be true 10, 20 years ago that they wanted a weak Secretary General, more a Secretary than a General, I don't think is applicable today. In fairness to the Security Council and our pow other powers that be, they understand, A, for the reforms that are necessary in the UN Secretariat, uh, throughout the whole UN uh, system, and to uh, uh, forge international partnerships uh, to deal with uh, the complexities of uh, 21st century challenges, it is uh, necessary someone uh, with exceptional qualities. Again, it doesn't mean uh, past Secretary General didn't have uh, those exceptional qualities, you know, I <laughs> should say. So, uh, mm. yeah, well, thank you. you maybe you, you, some of the students, <laughs> you know, which, uh, instead of me answering, maybe one of your students should answer this question. <laughs> and if he, answered, he or she answered brilliantly, you should grade it for... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll grade it as well as your report will be graded, yes. Uh, so I'm looking, is there any, any questions around here? I'm pretty sure what you said was crystal clear, but uh, maybe there are some reflections. Oh, okay, over there, please. Can you also identify yourself? That's helpful. Hi, um, my name is Venla Ronald. I'm the Vice President of the Uppsala Association of International Affairs. And I, you touched on it briefly uh, when it comes to the UN peacekeeping operations, but my question 
which is in two part, is what is your stance on military presence and military intervention um, in uh, peace building um, operations? And um, what would you say about um, the like, international peace building concerning sover the sovereignty of states? Thank you. Okay, I did it. So uh, I, I'll try to summarize. Uh, what do you think about military, the use of military in peace building missions? And, and uh, the second one was. Um, Yeah, how does international peace building relate to the sovereignty of states? Would it be too much of an interference, so to say, in, in, in the states? Uh, a, there are situations uh, where uh, there is an absolute need. You cannot wait. You have to deploy troops, armed troops. This is what happened in CAR, Central African Republic, and uh, it happened in Mali. If France uh, had not volunteered to intervene at the request of ECOWAS countries, uh, Bamako would have uh, been taken over by insurgents. So there are situations where we have uh, to, uh, and luckily, at least that time around, uh, the Security Council acted first, fast, but it acted uh, because there was a power uh, with uh, capabilities, and that is France, uh, to deploy. Uh, giving time for ECOWAS, for the UN, then to take over in due time with the traditional peace enforcement or peacekeeping uh, forces. And uh, in my personal uh, opinion and experience, there is no uh, uh, conflict between uh, injecting troops from armed intervention, but at the same time you start working on the political uh, uh, resolution of the problem. Uh, sometimes that is not possible. The military forces have to secure the, the territory uh, so that people on the ground, uh, national uh, community leaders, political leaders, feel safe enough uh, to uh, start engaging in dialogue. That's when you have other UN mechanisms, like the peace building architecture, that have to be deployed side by side with the uh, peacekeeping. Or not the peace building architecture of the UN, uh, if there are, uh, there are obstacles, difficulties to that, but there are regional actors. Uh, you know, uh, the search for peace uh, now in the future and in the past has not been a monopoly of the UN system. There have been many instances that I'm familiar with, uh, like the peace process in Guatemala. It was a lonely Norwegian uh, uh, former bishop of Oslo, Gunnar Stolset, member of the Nobel Peace Committee for 10 years, lonely years, he worked with the rebels, with the government. And when conditions were ripe, then he talked to the Norwegian government to take over. And in Middle East situations, and, uh, and in my own country, you know, uh, in 97, I end up here in uh, Uppsala. I never thought about Uppsala, you know. Uh, I came to Sweden many times, uh, Stockholm, but never thought of Uppsala. But in 1977, end up here, because they managed to bring all of us here in the dead of the winter, uh, <laughs> and I don't remember where we were, and that was the first time ever that I sat face to face with an in Indonesian, very respected in Indonesian, whose name I heard, Franz Seda, great man, uh, he passed away, uh, and uh, so there are individuals who can do that, sometimes even in the midst of a, a conflict. Did, that was your question. I... Thank you. And we can hear that you have a lot of experiences, and, and maybe we can contribute with the winter. <clears throat> the coldness may make our minds clearer. I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, continue. So thank you very much for all your questions or ideas that you had about questions, and thank you for expanding uh, 
for your speech and for expanding on the questions as well. So again, many thanks. Thank you. So uh, we will now have a piece of music, uh, and after that, a short ceremony uh, involving the Hammarskjöld Foundation and Rector Magnifica. Uh, after that, uh, we will uh, hear the organ playing and the procession will walk out. So please sit and enjoy the organ music while the procession walks out. So again, thank you. You are now the 17th person that has lined up to deliver a Dag Hammarskjöld lecture here at Uppsala University. We thank you and we congratulate you. Jose Ramos Horta was chosen by the Foundation and Uppsala University to deliver the 2015 Dag Hammarskjöld lecture for its outstanding efforts that have spanned over decades and continue today to promote peaceful solutions to conflict 
at the national and the international level and to strengthen UN's work on peace and security. In this way, he reflects and furthers Hammerschel's efforts to ensure that the UN Charter is applied in situations of armed conflict and that the UN is successful in carrying out its fundamental role to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. The university has found it appropriate to institute a medal which is only bestowed upon the Dog Hammerschel Lectures. The medal has been created by the artist Annette Rydström and it's cast in bronze. Its obverse shows Dog Hammerschel's portrait and the reverse, a handshake. The old symbol of Concordia, here representing Hammerschel's diplomatic efforts. In Latin, in the Latin inscription, Uppsala University dedicates the medal to the memory of, it, of his disciple for its outstanding achievements. President Ramos Horta, I now invite you to, the, to receive the 17th medal with your name engraved on the rim from the Vice-Chancellor.